If you have found uh, Matthew 8, please let everyone stand at this time. We're going to read beginning at verse 14, and we're going to read down through verse 17. Beginning at 14, and when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. When the even was come, they brought to him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Fulfill which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord God, for the saints that are here. We thank you for the word of God. We ask that your word, Lord, would bring life today. Let it bring healing. Let it bring restoration. Oh, by your quickening power, Lord, by the light that's in your word, God, we are healed and we thank you. Take control, Lord God, for these next few moments. Speak through me, for you live in us. And therefore, Lord God, speak that we may hear and that we may be made better for your glory and for your honor. We take control of the atmosphere now. We bind back every power that would interfere with the word of God. We forbid it and cancel its assignment. We refute the lies of Satan. Quicken our ears today that we may hear your word, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit. And we'll give you glory and we'll give you honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I would like for you to just pay close attention today. I'll perhaps not speak that long, but try and reiterate the things that God wants to be said and so that we can bring, get help from the Spirit today. I want to talk a little about healing the sick. Healing the sick. We have heard time and time again of God's mercy um, and the display of his grace and love. As we look through the Gospels, we see a clearer picture of what God is like manifested through his son. Am I right? When God looks upon human suffering, he has compassion on our weaknesses, on our infirmities. And so God wants to help us in our infirmities. And so we look now at the Bible as Jesus walked the face of this earth. It is said that there were several scholars in a certain denomination got together and they spent three years, they were paid and they spent three years in studies studying the life of Jesus and the works that he did. That was their special task and they were given three years to come up with the real reason as much as they could why Jesus did what he did. And after all of those studies, after three years, it was said that they could they concluded that the reason or the purposes by which Jesus did all the miracles and the healings that he did was to display the Father's heart toward his people. 
Remember now, coming out of the Old Testament, right? Where if you didn't do right, God killed you. So there was a lot of heavy fear. They tried to serve him. They served him out of a legalistic mode. They felt like if they didn't obey God, they would die. God would kill them. Sometimes just openly before congregation. So I'm so glad I didn't live in that time. But there's no guarantee I would have not been stoned. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but God saved you and I for these last days. When he was pouring out his grace, his divine enablement to help us to live this life. So the important thing is, as Pastor Juan was saying, there is help. We want to always remember that there is help, not in ourselves, but there is help in God. And God is eager to Help us. All the years that I've been in ministry, I, I have concluded more than ever that God truly, truly wants to help us in our infirmities and in the areas where we come short. So listen to what uh, we, is being said today. Um. We, this particular text here t- takes us back to Isaiah 53. It may be read a little differently because you had the Aramaic, the Hebrew style, and then you had now the Greek. That which is known as the Septuagint was Greek version of the Old Testament. The writers begin to interpret, and so some of the words are different. But he was talking about Isaiah 53. He said, and when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law laid and sick of a fever. And the Bible says he touched her hand and the fever left her. I want you to see Jesus here. He was a woman lying on her back, obviously sick, couldn't function now because of whatever the fever was. And in, 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 in those countries there, sometimes a fever could lead you to death, lead them to death. But here, when he came into Peter's house, there he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying sick of a fever. And the Bible says he touched her hand and the fever left her. That divine life just flowed through him. And whenever Jesus touches you, no matter where, you need that touch. That life will drive out any area of infirmities and sickness or disease. Because he's the same yesterday and today and forever. So if there's infirmities... There's weaknesses. We'll de- define that word a bit, a little bit later. But this was a fulfillment of scriptures. Isaiah looked and prophesied concerning the Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One, the Christ. And He talked about him as a suffering servant and then he goes and talks about why he suffered. What was laid upon him, the iniquity of us all was laid upon him. Wow. All of our sins all of the hidden sins, all of the blatant, outright sins, all of, all of the things that happened as a result of a twisted, distorted life that we came into the world and a nature 
Bible says himself took our infirmities and he bare our sicknesses. So now, he came to fulfill scripture. Look at, I'm going to read what he says again in verse 16. When the even was come, they brought to him many that were possessed with demons or devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word. Hallelujah for his word. And healed all that were sick. Now, if, 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 if he in this situation had healed some and prophesied or quoted the scripture, it may, may have had a different effect upon us. But the fact that he quoted the passage of scripture of his substitutionary life, it said he healed all that were sick so that there could be no debate about the will of God. Are you with me? And he said he did this so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities. Okay, now, what, what, what do you mean infirmities? This word infirmities in the Greek. It means feebleness of body or mind. Feebleness of body or mind. Frailty. Which deals with disease, weaknesses, sicknesses, infirmities, the whole gamma. Himself took our feebleness of body or mind. There's feebleness in the mind. There can be feebleness in the body, right? There can be weakness. Sometimes we know what we ought to do and can't do it, have no strength to do it. Feebleness. Look at somebody say, that's feebleness. Weakness, inability to do what we ought to do. But there is help in God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but I, I remember many times in certain situations, uh, God telling me something and I, and I tried, but yet somehow failed, came short of what God had in mind, only to understand that as I paused and looked up and called upon the name of the Lord, he provided a strength that I did not have. You got to hear what I'm saying today. God will give. Actually, God is given what we need to function at maximum capacity. He's given that. We, we, we can't do it now. But we can receive from God. So as Jesus began to speak of Isaiah 53, the fulfillment of scripture, we, we have it here today. Then just by way of review, we talked for the last a few services back about demons and their activities. Anybody remember that? I was listening to the man of God on yesterday, and he helped me by, and sometimes we, we be, God be teaching us. And he said God spent seven years teaching him about demons to help the body. So that just, I said, oh, wow, wonderful. I got you, Lord. What it said to me is pay attention to what God is teaching you about demons because he want to free his people up. Hallelujah. Glory to God. One of the things that I appreciate about the man of God, he entered into his fourth and final phase. And when he closed his eyes, he'll be able to say, Lord, I did what you asked me to do. All that you gave me, I fulfilled. God, I want to say that about my life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. But then, so he'd been teaching us about demons and their activities. 
One of the things I want to remind you concerning demons, they hate exposure. We gave you the example. I won't give the same example if you give an example. But light. Light. Truth is light, right? So truth exposes demonic activities. And when that demonic activity is exposed, now they got to try to figure out what they're going to do because they know that it's easy for them to have to leave the area that they've been dominating. Sometimes they'll fight the person and say, you know, don't, put, don't pay attention to what that man's saying. Because you're unmasking them. And when you, when you expose them, it weakens them. And so they may fight your, your mind. They may fight you and tell you, that man don't know what he's talking about. You don't even have to listen to that stuff. Because they are there and they don't want to come out. So I know he's mad with me when I talk like this. But Jesus died that we might be free. Isn't that right? So we uh, talked about demonic activities. They hate exposure. And so I'm doing my best to try and expose their activities so that God's people might enjoy a holier walk, a greater freedom, and a greater peace. Isn't that good? Praise the Lord. Their activities, they lie, they deceive, they oppress, they torture, they tempt. They do everything they can to hinder a newborn believer. And not only a newborn, but they do that to, to hinder any Christian. Especially when a Christian goes, is going forward in God. So the activities of many, and they vary. They, they are not afraid to uh, speak to ministers, prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors. They have no such respect in that sense. Because they had no better sense than to come to the word himself. And think to try and deceive him. So look at your neighbor and say, well, I know he's going to come my way. <laughs> if he had no better gall than to come to the Savior himself and think that the Savior would yield to him, that's gall. Come to the one that literally made him. That's gall. You hear me? But he did that because Jesus was made in the likeness of men. He wouldn't have dared had Jesus been in his glory. As a matter of fact, demons would cry when he came. Did, did you come to torment us before the time? In other words, we, we know we get we know our time is short, but you on the scene, does that mean you come to deal with us now? Jesus said, just hold your peace, buddy. Hold your peace. But I love Jesus. He is some mighty champion. My God Almighty. I just, I read the gospels and I get so excited. He walks into this territory where the baddest thing on the island came. Growling and doing everything he could. What are you doing on this island? Where are you coming from? Jesus looked at him and said, hold your peace and come out of him. And he didn't bat an eye. My God, hallelujah. Glory to God. And you see, when demons about to come out, they start to, they start, when, they, when, when they start getting weak, they start just wimping. Wimping. Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to do that. And they come to you like they're so strong. Like the, oh, man, like I'll tear you to pieces and so on. But when you stand up to them, they go, oh. Can we negotiate this thing? You know. <laughs> and you do like Jesus did. Get out. Serve notice on them. Evict them. Isn't that right? Get out in the name of Jesus. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. The activities are many. And God said the harvest is plenteous. But the laborers are few. God raised up laborers, isn't that right? Raise up men and women with that power. Knowing who they are in God. Men and women that have gone through the test of time. Men and women who have gone through the fire. Men and women who have been tried. Oh, God. They've been tried. Hallelujah. And Job said, after I'm tried. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He didn't say, I'm going to burn in the fire. I'm not going to drown in the water. He said, after I'm tried, I'm coming forth like pure gold. I'm going to look more like Jesus than when I did when I went in the fire. Never try to intimidate you, making you feel like a trial is going to destroy you. But remember what Job said. I'm coming forth brighter than ever, purer than ever. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. So we expose them in their activities. God did mention to us, therefore, that were prominent among us, and one was the theme of the rebellion. He mentioned not only demons of rebellion, demons of religion, demons of unforgiveness, and demons of infirmity. So we're going to talk a little bit about spirits of infirmities today. And one of the ways to deal with religious spirits is to go back to the blood. Go back to Calvary. Hallelujah, there is none righteous. None that doeth good. My Lord have mercy. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. And, and, and those religious spirits, they begin to squirm. Hallelujah. None good but God. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I looked at the life of Jesus and Jesus, uh, they said, good master, what shall I do? He said, well, you calling me good. He said, there's none good but the Father. So what he was doing is as he walked as a man full of the Holy Ghost, uh, how we should walk. And so he was pointing out to them, the Father is the only good thing, hallelujah, that's in our lives. Isn't that right, somebody? <laughs> Glory to God. Then he said, so there's righteous spirits or pharisaical, I call them, and, but the demons of infirmities. Remember we talked about infirmities had to do with feebleness of mind and body. Now those spirits of infirmity can attach themselves to areas of our lives. Sometimes they attack our personality. And make us feeble. Make us not able to stand and do what we should do. That's feebleness. Or they attack our minds. And where the mind may have a strong hold. We'll talk a little more about that later. But I uh, just want to throw that out for now. So, but, but feebleness is, is, is a wide range. And it covers a lot of areas. So... When we say infirmities, weakness, feebleness of mind, it can be sickness or disease, frailties, it's, 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 it's that which is short of what we ought to be. So now, so he says in, in Matthew, what he did, verse 16, when the even was come, they brought to him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirit with his word and healed all that were sick. The demon oppressed, that, I mean, they were impressed in their mind, oppressed in their bodies. They were hindered in a lot of ways. And so uh, he did that to fulfill prophecy uh, that says himself took our infirmities. 
and he bare our sicknesses. So think about it now. The infirmities, if God, Christ died for us to make whole in all these areas of our lives, he has to supply what we need. And it starts with salvation. Now think about it. I want you to get this simple truth. When we were not saved, there was a gulf between us and salvation. We could not penetrate it of our own. But we heard the gospel. And when we heard the gospel, we responded to the gospel. Because we responded in faith to the gospel, God broke us out of that prison and he translated us into another kingdom which is the kingdom of his son that was his power everybody with me but what on our part we were to believe right the supply came from heaven now, this is important now we talk, still talking about healing the sick but it's important that we go this way all right so we became saved. Our name became uh, written in the book of life, right? So there was, there, was a, there was a transference in a matter of moments or seconds from people that were held by the chains of darkness to people that were in the light. Are you with me? That happened because we expressed faith in the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross. All right. So that makes it legitimate for us. Okay. So since that happened, we were saved. That means old things were passed away. We became new creatures in God. Now, the, 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 what God does now is continue his work in and through us by freeing us from the trappings of the old nature from the trappings of reasoning, from the trappings of sin's effect. Are you with me? All right, so now uh, I'm trying to share with you what, what's being said. The spirits of infirmity, they enter more than one way, but these are some key ways that they enter mainly. They can enter through ancestral sin. A person can be born into the world, and in spite of a person says, this child is so innocent, so, innocent, so nah, it ain't no spirit, and so-and-so. In spite of that, they can be passed on through the bloodline. Doctors, people that are unsaved, understand that. They give you a list of things, says if anybody in your family, your parents or anybody has had any heart attacks, strokes, or hypertension and diabetes, and the list goes on, right? And so if you check those things there, they say, okay, so this goes beyond them. So this is a generational. That's what they tell. That's what they say. They know that. Nobody argues with that. Isn't that right? But the church should have at least that knowledge, right? So they enter through generational past sins of our ancestors. Sins that we didn't commit. All right. You remember in Samuel? I think it's 2 Samuel, I believe. Where David sinned with Bathsheba. And that curse of sin passed down Four generations. His son, his grandson, and his great-grandson. So if they decided, oh, I'm not going to, before Christ, that is. If they decided, oh, I'm not going to be under this, forget it. I'm not my grandfather. I'm not my great-grandfather, so I'm not having this. It wouldn't have done any good unless somehow God Almighty had broken this thing. So now we can rejoice because through Christ, all that stuff is broken. All that stuff is broken. No matter what my great-grandfather did and great-grandmother did, I don't have to bear the sins of what they did. But if I don't know that, 
Do you think Satan says, well, they're saved, so I got to leave them alone? He's going to hold on to anything he can. And he'll keep you in bondage. He'll keep you bound. He'll keep you sick. He'll keep everything because of But once the light turned on, when God turned the light on, the person says, oh, my God. You mean I'm, I'm suffering for something that my grandfather did? And I didn't do it. Now you can apply Galatians 3.13. Christ became a curse for us. Isn't that right? When he died on the cross, he didn't leave nothing. He died that we might have life to the full. But it's got to be appropriated. Are you with me? Just like we appropriated the faith for salvation to be saved, it's got to be applied. It doesn't come automatically. It's available for us. Everybody with me? It's all available. But we have to appropriate it by faith. So what we do is we look into the word of God. And so the word of God shows us what we have. And once we look into the word of God, it says, oh, so that means I can be free from the clutches of the sins that of my ancestor. Because what Christ did, he broke that curse in every form. Isn't that right? The Bible says curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. So Christ became, it was pointing to the camera, the the tree of the cross. And they, so what, what he was basically saying is that he became a curse for us. And thank God the old Adam failed. So I was on the first, before Christ, I was on the, the, the old Adam. And so I, I couldn't help myself because Adam sinned and I was born in it. But now when I'm reborn, I'm born, reborn under the leadership of someone that never failed. Are you with me? He was in all points tempted like we are, but yet he never failed, never sinned. And as a matter of fact, the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So now we're under the hand and we're born of Jesus Christ. We are born of an obedient spirit. Are you with me? Don't nobody say I can't obey. You are born of a, an obedient spirit. Born of Jesus, he said, beloved, now are we the sons of God. We have the spirit of Jesus Christ. So now I want to pause there. Everybody, we all can obey if we're born again. All right? Because we are born of an obedient spirit. So we're talking knowledge, right? I must understand that. See, if Satan feels like I don't understand that and I'm trying to get good in my own strength, then he'll, he, he knows that we're fighting a losing battle. And once he knows we get a hold of the truth, then he can't touch that. He can't touch that. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you can walk with God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Okay, so all right, now we're going. So demons... We talked about, like I said, the four areas there, and there are plenty of uh, areas, but these are the four that he gave me. And um, so we're dealing with the spirits of infirmity. Last thing I say about demons here uh, right now is, is this. Demons and Satan are legalists. So if you, when you deal with demons, you have to deal with them according to truth and what's right. You can't deal, if, you, if you're trying to deal with demon like this, you get away from me. No, get away from me. Just leave me alone. Go on, leave me alone. He could say, who are you? But when you start talking about truth, he got to respect truth. When Jesus, when he came to Jesus, Jesus says, it is written. That's the authority that we stand on. When you're dealing with spiritual powers. Hallelujah. You have to use the word of God. 
Hallelujah. It is written. And when you stand on that word of God, you're standing on authority. And God will back you up. He will back you up. Remember this. God will back you up because his word he will honor. He will honor his word. So the legalists, what do you mean? They go by the book. They go by the legal book. And uh, if, you, if, if they are in an area illegally, or let me say it like this. If they have come in through somebody's continual sin, they are there, you gave them that right. And so to cast them out without dealing with the sin, you can't do it because they are legalists. They'll just look at Jesus and say, you see what they're doing. You see what they're doing. So the door was open. I just walked right in. So now, once you deal with and shut that door, he no longer, he's a legalist. Remember what I said? He's there. If he's there legal, then as my daughter preached, you can't just evict him until you deal with truth. Serve notice on him legally. Christ died for my sins. He is my righteousness. See, he is my righteousness. This is how you're dealing with the devil if he's got you going legally. He is my righteousness. And I am complete in him, right? Are you with me? Say, no spirit of legalism, back up. Because now you're standing on truth, right? I know I'm, I'm teaching some stuff here, but I want you to follow that because it's really, if he gets you work, trying to work and work and fight and work and fight and work and fight and we have you to work and work and work and tired and your hands throw up, I don't know what to do. But if you stand, now I've had this happen so many times, many times fighting him until I was exhausted and all of a sudden the Lord says, he just said, he said, just praise me. So I start praising him and then all of a sudden he, he give me an illumination. They have me to speak it and I speak it and the devil back right up. He's a legalist. And so God helps us in those times, right? He helps us. And know that he's already defeated. I remember God saying, just remind him. He, remind him of his demise. He's defeated. He's defeated. He, he's already defeated. You're not trying to defeat the devil. He's already defeated, right? He's already defeated. He's been stripped of all that he has. My Lord have mercy. He's already been defeated. Hallelujah. And when you think about that, you see, that's, that's another reason why you can rejoice. This is another reason why you can rejoice if the devil won't try. Just begin to praise the Lord. Isn't that right? He's been defeated. If he, if he can make you think that he's not defeated, then you got a war going on a long, long, long time. But if you understand that he's al already been defeated, then, hallelujah, then you can praise the Lord. Isn't that right? Let me praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Watch it and see what he does when you start praising the Lord. He just start backing up. Just start backing up. I, I love Jesus. I remember this time when God would show me in the spirit how to deal with the devil. And he said, just, he said, don't, don't, don't let him take you where you don't need to go. You just stand on my word. He's already been dealt with. And yeah, he's, he's, he's going to try to do this and try to do that. But start thanking me and start praising me. And just, just let me, my presence move on in there. And begin to deal with him. It is so beautiful. It is so beautiful. I told you before. I shared this before. Some of them didn't hear it. But some. Yeah, I remember one time he, just, he was coming my way. And, and he, he had tricked me before. Tried to make me feel. Oh, God, I got to pray. And he coming. He, he, in the spirit, I see him coming this way. And this particular time. I don't know what happened. I just started praising the Lord. And as he was coming this way. And I started praying the Lord. He stopped. So God was to show me, said, look, I want to show you something. Don't let the devil play tricks on you. Isn't that right? You praise, have a happy spirit, a, a, joy, a, a spirit of joy and praise God. And, and, and you become too hot to 
to handle. Come on, let's give God some praise right now. Hallelujah. God, I thank you. You're so good. Hallelujah. You concentrate on praising the Lord, and the Lord will concentrate on what you need. Isn't that right? Come on, let's praise him again. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Paul said it is a weapon. Paul said it is a weapon, right? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice to say the same thing to you. He said it's not grievous, but for you it is safeguard. Isn't that right? Let's praise him one more time. He's worthy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. You are so good. Mm. You are so magnificent.